Good afternoon, and welcome to the 11th annual Theodore M. Hesburgh Award and Frank Cahill Lecture. They're both jointly sponsored by the Center for Ethics and Religious Values in Business and the Institute for Ethical Business Worldwide. I'm Professor Pat Murphy and will be the MC for this important event. I view my role as to give a few introductions to start with and then try to keep the proceedings uh, on schedule. So our order of events this afternoon, we will begin with uh, the introductions, then move to the Hesburg Award, uh, then we will uh, invite our MBA students up and talk about the Frank Cahill lecture, and uh, so it'll be part one and part two, but stay tuned, please. So first, I'd like to introduce several members of the Cahill family who are with us today. Frank's son, Mike Cahill from Fort Wayne, uh, who's CEO of Tower Financial Corporation, and his brother Tim Kale, senior VP of SCIO Inspire, and tell your mom we're sorry that she wasn't able to make it uh, this year, and uh, please tell her that she was missed. And uh, Frank and Marty's uh, niece, Kathleen Sweeney, uh, welcome back, Kathleen. So please join me uh, in welcoming the uh, Kale family to the event. Second, I'd like to recognize Jack and Margaret Burgess, who are in the front row here. The Burgess Lecture Series in Business Ethics, which occurs in the falls, named after them. Welcome back. It's great to see Jack, you, and Margaret. <laughs> Third, I'd like to welcome Armin Broger of Levi Strauss and his wife, Elena, who are here from Europe to accept the Hesburgh Award. You'll hear more about uh, Armin later, but in the front row, uh, Armin and Elena. Welcome. Now Father Ollie Williams will give you a brief introduction to Father Ted, who uh, for most of us doesn't need an introduction, but uh, Father Ollie, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Pat. Probably there's no one on this campus or maybe in this state or this nation who needs less of an introduction than Father Ted Hesburgh. But I will tell you uh, how we came to call this award the Hesburgh Award for Business Ethics. A number of years back, we decided we should give an annual award uh, for a company or business leader who has demonstrated not only outstanding performance in running an organization, but also uh, outstanding performance in the areas of ethics. We considered uh, naming it after a number of very famous leaders throughout the United States and the world. And one of my colleagues said, well, there's nobody better in this area than Father Ted Hesburgh. And uh, I had sort of thought that, but I thought being a Holy Cross father, I probably shouldn't bring it up. Um, and Ted has been a good friend for many years. And in short, uh, the reason uh, we finally called it the Hesburgh Award is he has demonstrated outstanding leadership, been the president of Notre Dame for 35 years, uh, the longest uh, president that Notre Dame has ever had and perhaps any university in the country. Obviously, uh, just look around you, you can see in many ways, uh, this is the house that Father Hesburgh built. If you look around this campus, those of us who attended the school many years ago uh, remember a small Midwestern college that uh, most people knew for football. And today, uh, most people know Notre Dame around the world uh, as one of the great academic institutions uh, in the globe. Not only has uh, Father Hesburgh uh, built a wonderful university, uh, but he has been acclaimed as a great leader in not only the academic field, but the ethical field. As you may know, he has more honorary doctorates than anyone in the history of such things. Uh, and we could go on all day, uh, but Pat only gave me two minutes. Uh, so. That is why we call it the Father Ted Hesburgh Award for Business Ethics, and you'll hear more uh, shortly. Thank you, Ollie. Next, I'd like to call up M Melissa Molyneux, who, our MBA student who nominated Levi Strauss for the Hesburgh Award, and she will provide some background on the company and uh, why they're deserving of the award. Melissa, please come up.
this year's has berg award goes to a company that many of us are already familiar with it operates facilities in one hundred and ten countries employs over ten thousand people worldwide and revolutionize the apparel industry by becoming the first to market blue jeans a product that has become part of the daily uniform for many of us Levi Strauss and Company designs blue jeans, dress and casual pants, shirts, jackets, and accessories for men, women, and children under the Levi's, Dockers, and Levi Strauss signature brands. Throughout its history, Levi Strauss has managed to shape its corporate culture by maintaining a commitment to four core values, empathy, originality, integrity, and courage. In 1993, Levi Strauss demonstrated both integrity and courage when it identified working conditions in China as a pervasive violation to human rights. Consequently, they withheld business from China for 15 years until working conditions improved to a level they felt was acceptable. This decision to support human rights by ending all relationships with contractors in China is only one major milestone in a rich history of ethical firsts. The Levi Strauss Foundation became the first corporate foundation in the United States to address the HIV AIDS epidemic in 1982, long before social responsibility became popular in the corporate world. Over the years, the foundation has donated over $38 million to HIV and AIDS organizations in 40 different countries. Levi Strauss continued its history as a pioneer in 1991, when it became the first multinational apparel company to extend a comprehensive code of conduct beyond its own facilities to its suppliers. This initiative was part of a goal to provide individuals making Levi Strauss products worldwide with safe and healthy working conditions as well as dignity and respect. In 2007, Levi Strauss and Company became a founding member of the UN Global Compact's CEO Water Mandate, a public-private initiative designed to assist companies in the development, implementation, and disclosure of water sustainability pol policies and practices. In addition, the company mandates maximum water waste and contamination levels for its facilities and regularly publishes a water mandate progress report. As the challenges continue to evolve, Levi Strauss and Company continues to act as an industry leader by identifying innovative ways to eliminate waste. For example, they recently switched from high volume plastic hangers to reused hangers, which will allow them to avoid purchasing over 200 tons of plastic this year. In addition, in 2008, they donated over 200,000 pairs of recycled jeans as insulation material for the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. This effort contributed to their platinum rating for leadership in energy and environmental design. Finally, I would like to note that this year, Levi Strauss will become the first major retailer to include messaging encouraging consumers to donate used clothing on its product care tags. The care tag for our planet program is a partnership with Goodwill Industries that empowers consumers to participate, to participate in Levi's mission to reduce waste and prolong the life cycle of its clothing. In conclusion, Levi Strauss and Company has a rich ethical history and continues to maintain a commitment to its core values by identifying and executing innovative ethical, environmental, and socially responsible initiatives. We are proud to welcome Armin Broger, the president of Levi Strauss Europe, back to Notre Dame. He is a graduate of the Notre Dame MBA program and has held impressive positions with Tommy Hilfinger, Seven for All Mankind, and the Walt Disney Company. 
It is with great pleasure that we present the 2010 Hesburgh Award to Levi Strauss and Company. Well, good afternoon to all of you, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the great honor uh, of this award. It is indeed beautiful to see uh, some of the people that have taught you, like Father Williams, Father uh, Pat Murphy, although not directly, and Father Hesburgh. Uh, probably my journey wouldn't have been as exciting a journey if one of the chapters of that journey wouldn't have been the two years I've spent uh, on this campus. So thank you again very much uh, for the award. It is a great honor for Levi Strauss to be uh, awarded such a prestigious recognition. And it is a pleasure for me uh, to be back here at Notre Dame. I'm acutely aware that one of your last priorities is going to hear alumni reminiscing. So uh, I uh, will spare you all the stories of what I think is different. I will spare you the tales about my student life here in South Bend. There are, however, two things uh, that I do want uh, to say to you. One is very important, and the other one infinitely less important. The first one is to recognize how blessed we all are to be able to continue to enjoy Father Hesburgh's moral and academic leadership at a time where immigration forms called st foreign students like me non-resident aliens, uh, Father Hesburgh came up to me at one function before Christmas one year and started talking to me in Italian straight away. And that's when I really believed he had God-gifted uh, capabilities because how could he have possibly known? Uh, and I'm st I never forgot that. And Father Hasberg, it is a very high honor to receive this award from your hands. The second, and infinitely less important, is my persistent violation of dress codes. When I first started my MBA 25 years ago, after having taken a glance at campus and pretty much looked at how people dress, I decided to show up to the opening ceremony of the academic year wearing, what else, a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. Obviously, to my great horror, I found everybody was wearing suits and tailleurs. And so it was quite unique that the European was the one that was the worst dressed one among the group. Uh, well, 25 years later, I almost did it again, and I was going to show up in jeans and a t-shirt when, thanks to Pat Murphy, uh, I, had, I changed my attire, and I'm not standing here in jeans, which is what I obviously, as you can imagine, am happy to wear every day. Now, I want to talk to you today about something that is more important, though, than dress code. It is behavioral code. Anyone who's ever worked for Levi Strauss and wants to start talking about the responsibilities of a corporation is well advised to do that with a great degree of modesty. This is not a new topic for our company. The relationship between our products, our people, the, the role they play in society is woven deep 
if you excuse the pun, in the fabric of our place. It is a part of our history. The stories and examples of how the company has supported communities and the environment that it operates in are many in the 157 years that we exist. They are a significant part of the syllabus for every new employee. So from now, how we kept employees on the payroll after the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, to how we pioneered, as you mentioned before, our HIV AIDS policies for employees, a dramatically important thing to do, especially in some of our South African uh, affiliates, or how we created the Red Tap Foundation that helps retired employees to deal with their hardships of life. We do remain committed today, despite the challenging economic times that affect all of us. We call it profit with principles, and it's a part of what guides our daily activities. It is part of what we call our true north. So in the context of such a humbling history, and having been with the company for just over three years, I'd like to just pick uh, one subject, the subject into responsibility of companies today. This is the dilemma that I was mentioning earlier. Today might be one of the most difficult times in recent memory to talk about trust, responsibility, and reputations in business. The financial crisis and the Wall Street excesses of the last couple of years have, if anything, eroded the public confidence and the trust in business. Even the motives of the most well-intentioned companies, I'm afraid, have really been hurt in what I wouldn't hesitate to define a big mess. One of the other victims has been the very notion of corporate social responsibility. The idea that companies have a higher responsibility and the idea that the responsibility is more than maximizing profit. The general cynicism about businesses that has emerged over the last year as the markets melted has encouraged critics. On one side, we hear more people echoing the monetarist principle that you're supposed to only and purely serve your shareholders. On the other side, some argue that CSR has become a form of brand marketing. It is a rich debate. Both sides have a point. It is very difficult for management to do the right thing. Despite this argument, there is some practical evidence that management can do the right thing. In fact, not long ago, McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm, surveyed a large group of financial officers about CSR. The CFOs found that they did believe whatever their companies did in terms of CSR strengthened the values, strengthened the, nerd, the texture of the company. The problem is none of them really knew how to measure the impact of that success. So with this level of doubt and confusion about how do we do what's right, what can a company do to make a difference? I think we may have to retake a good look at what, what the social responsibility of a company is. I want to focus on one aspect of it, sustainability. Now, sustainability is hardly a new movement. Companies have been talking about green for quite a some time now. And today, I believe that we need to establish a new credibility in the area of green and the area of sustainability. We need a more rigorous and more systematic, more measurable way of illustrating the problem and even more so of solving it. If sustainability in business slips into cliches or into corporate slogans, then I think we're failing on our role as responsible business leaders. In order to recapture the public trust, we need to be as rigorous about sustainability as we are about the profit that our businesses generate. Our financial reporting, our relationships with our customers, the way we treat our employees. At Levi Strauss, thinking about sustainability was a natural extension of how we saw ourselves acting in society. 
But the more we looked at the world, and quite frankly, even more so, the more we looked at ourselves, we thought we weren't doing enough. There is more to be done in order to be able to effectively deploy sustainability in an organization. Like the CFOs who knew that corporate social responsibility was important, but didn't measure it, we felt the same way about sustainability. How do we concretely measure it? How do we give management the tools to deploy it? What is our real impact? And one could ask, how can we engage the CFOs to understand that not doing it is a risk as opposed to doing it? So we decided to take another step. To us, it was more like a leap. We wanted to build a rigorous and credible assessment of our own impact on the environment. Something that was scientifically based, measurable. Something that needed a third party, an independent third party to help us with. We wanted to understand not just the impact of all the programs that we had started. We wanted to understand what is the real impact of the products that we make, market, and sell to the whole environment, a cradle-to-grave study. Our instinct was that if we understood the full scope of that, we would create a sustainability program that was far more comprehensive and meaningful because it was based on the core activity of our company, which is the product. We also felt that understanding our true impact would give us the clarity to articulate our vision and set priorities for our environmental work around the world. To be effective of implementing a vision, executives want to understand the why and the how. And when they understand that, they want to understand the when and the how much. So allow me to take a few minutes to tell you about what became known as life cycle assessment inside our company. So we asked an independent team of environmental scientists to do a life cycle analysis of our core products, and we took a gene and a khaki. Not difficult to imagine, we took a 501 and a Docker's khaki. And we wanted to know everything, absolutely everything, that went into the full life cycle of this product, from cradle to grave. Every input, every cost, every impact from the agricultural impact at the cotton fields to uh, the sowing plants. What we found, I thought, was really surprising. It wasn't a surprise that our products have a significant environmental impact. We would have expected that. After all, they're made of cotton. And over the whole life cycle, from growing the 2.2 kilos, which must be something around 7 pounds, of cotton that goes into a pair of 501s, to milling that fabric, to sewing it, shipping it, and consumers washing and drying it through a considerable amount of life cycle. Well, a pair of 501s resulted in 32 kilos, or roughly 70 pounds, of carbon being emitted into the atmosphere. That's about six trees. And what is even more amazing, we used, over the life cycle of the product, 3,480 liters of water, which is almost 1,000 gallons, equivalent to taking a six-hour shower. What did surprise us was that the vast majority of this impact, climate, water, chemical, was outside of our direct control, which typically would have been a wonderful excuse to say, ah, sorry, not our fault. But we wanted to make sure that we address the most important impact in this chain of, if you want, environmental situations. And that is consumers washing and drying the product, which is ultimately the biggest surprise that we had. So as you can imagine, changing the way people care for their clothes is a rather large undertaking. Once the product leaves the store, there isn't really much that we can do, we thought. So we wanted to figure out how to change the behavior of the over 15 million Levi's consumers in a year. So let me dive for a second into the aspect of consumer education. Through our life cycle assessment, we learned a lot about washing and drying clothes, quite frankly, probably more than we wanted to. 
a big lot. Some of it pretty basic and also derived from the many habits that we have observed in the over 110 markets that we operate in, and some more complicated, from washing in cold water instead of warm, switching to newer environmentally friendlier washing machines. We're now witnessing uh, the beginning of domestic uh, dry cleaning, which is based on new washers that use either ozone or oxygen and therefore do not use any water at all. Some of them are in experimental stages. We're looking at how to uh, collaborate with those uh, companies to deploy them faster to the market. And so, <clears throat> you know, others uh, more familiar to Mediterranean cultures like line drying as opposed to using a dryer. If we could encourage customers to wash their jeans less frequently, that would reduce definitely uh, the climate, energy, and water impact all at once. For example, if you washed your jeans once every two weeks instead of every week, and you did that for over two years, you could cut the carbon impact from 32 to 21 kilograms of carbon dioxide, which means by a third. Now, our creative people insist that you shouldn't be washing your jeans more than once a year. I think that may be going a touch too far, but uh, until uh, at least those ozone washing machines are, perfect, are perfected. And by the way, you also save a lot of money. Small steps, indeed, but a big impact. We recently launched, as was mentioned before, uh, an exciting new partnership with Goodwill, and that is a care tag for our planet, to spread the word with consumers that caring for their clothes can significantly make a difference to uh, the environmental impact that it generates. So by changing uh, the care tags, we were the first major apparel company to change our garment care labels to urge consumers to take action by washing in cold water, by line drying, donating unwanted clothing, and so we're hoping to put a dent into the over 68 billion pounds of clothing that end up in a landfill every year. This was launched in US retail stores and we're working to roll this out globally this year. Now, mind you, overwashing clothes would do miracles to our business because that would mean that those jeans would need to be replaced a lot more frequently than they are if they're not washed as frequently. But the, we believe that the environmental impact has to take the priority in this particular case. Another initiative that we started recently is Fashion Futures. We worked with a UK-based sustainable development group, uh, which presented four possible scenarios of what the fashion world could look like in 2025. Some pretty amazing, like a completely cotton-free environment. Some uh, purely derived with the technology we use to wash and, and, and treat the genes. So this is the kind of forward thinking that will help us uh, progress and continue the legacy of our company in the future. So what we, have we all learned in all this? Great companies do think about the future because they know someday soon it will be here and they know their children will spend the rest of their life there. As far as the challenge uh, for you, as you are, many of you are approaching your first career choices, be aware of the choices. What kind of thinking is going to create sustainable businesses of the future? And how much, how much of the possible growth the business will have in general will be driven by sustainability? So these are the hard choices that you will face as you enter the workforce. And therefore, I'm encouraging you to not sit on the sidelines and watch other people do it. I'm encouraging you to join us, step into the arena, and, and, and change uh, the environmental aspect of how we do business for, the, for a better future. You gotta do it for yourself, you gotta do it to become a new brand of leaders that companies are eagerly awaiting to recruit. Thank you very much and good luck. We have time for a couple or three questions, I think. Armin's willing to, and if you could come to the front, or if you're sitting in the back, just talk loud, please. So who'll be first? Yes. and how your suppliers viewed their sustainable actions? Were, were you able to 
by releasing the code of conduct for your suppliers change how they did business in the long term, or was it just a short term? Oh, it, it is. It is one of the most fun fundamental changes we've ever done in the company, and we're not alone anymore. But the amazing thing about our code of conduct is when it was done, which was uh, you know before people thought that that was relevant. And the second thing that was interesting is that in many of the markets uh, where we sourced our product, we used to be the largest customer. So when we pulled out, many of the governments quickly introduced legislation that would allow suppliers to adapt to a new way of doing business. And in fact, as soon as we found the environment to be corresponding to our code of conduct, we, bet we went back in. So it is uh, a permanent situation and quite frankly getting even more stringent as, uh, as time is evolving. Thanks. So. Anything else? Yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about China's uh, uh, Levi Strauss policy vis-a-vis -vis China when you, the reasons why you pulled out of China in the early 1990s and how you considered that decision and then again the decision to go back to China? Well, uh, I'm not sure I can give you a, an in-depth answer because uh, obviously I wasn't there, but uh, and I uh, normally prefer to comment on stuff that I've actually lived through. However, there were two aspects to it. The first one was our pretty clear statements about how we would like to treat employees uh, and our equally clear awareness of the fact that in many of the Chinese factories we were using, that was not the case at the time. And the second one, clearly, our very stringent Foreign Corrupt Practices Act behavior that did not allow us to engage in practices that many of our competitors didn't seem to be uh, inappropriate, but we definitely deemed inappropriate. I mean, we've had the same, uh, so we did it the expensive way, but we did it the right way. And, uh, you know, you could argue that some of it is due to the fact that we're a private company and therefore, if you want the intellectual imprint of the family uh, that owns the business is still very visible. Uh, but I believe that we should have done the same even if we were a public company. We've recently entered the Russian market and the same situation has presented itself one more time. So do it the slow way, do it the expensive way, but do it the right way. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you, Armin, for those thoughtful and excellent remarks to give us, all of us, some things to, to think about. Now I'd like to move to the Frank Cahill Lecture, and before introducing our student panelists, I'd like to provide some background on, the, on Frank Cahill and the Frank Cahill Lecture. The Frank Cahill Business Ethics Lecture was established after Frank's untimely death from cancer at the age of 59. Frank grew up in Syracuse, New York, and one thing I don't think we told him, Father Ted, is you grew up in Syracuse, New York, right? So the uh, Cahills and the uh, Hesburghs from the same area. And Frank always dreamed of attending Notre Dame, and his graduation was the beginning of an ab abiding connection between the Cahill family and the university. His son Mike, who's with us today, is a business grad, and his oldest grandson, Sean, is a recent alumnus. And he... Uh, earned a BS in commerce and then had a very successful career as an executive in the trucking industry and Frank retired as an officer for Roadway Express. And integrity, character, and ethics were a cornerstone of Frank's life and career throughout his nearly 40 years in business and he experienced many firsthand challenges uh, and having a commitment to ethical business practice and to pursue both his personal and professional success. And Frank recognized in the family uh, in his 
bequest here to Notre Dame, a real need to introduce young professionals to some of the ethical considerations they'll face early in the business world, and that's what we're going to do here shortly with our panel of current MBA students. So I'll uh, introduce the three and they'll come up and share a few of the ethical challenges that they have in encountered early in their career. First is Molly Iarochi, a first year MBA. Molly has her BBA from Notre Dame in management and entrepreneurship. She served as a sales associate in the trade show production for MMPI in Chicago before coming back to Notre Dame. Carl Jensen is a second year MBA, has a BA in accounting from the University of Utah, one of our future uh, football opponents. Before uh, his MBA, Carl was a credit analyst at Prime Alliance Bank in Charlotte, North Carolina. Our third panelist is Matt Kelly. He's a BS in finance from Fairfield University, and he lists his former title as restaurateur, right, Matt, uh, in a family business uh, for some years before coming back to uh, MBA. And I do have to convey the regrets of Azar Williams, who agreed and wanted to participate, but he was called away for an interview at the last minute. So please uh, join me in giving a hand to our panelists, and they'll have a few remarks. And then we'll turn it to Q&A. Good afternoon. Um, as Professor Murphy said, my name is Molly Irochi, and um, I, not too long ago, was sitting out there just like many of you undergrads. Um, so I couldn't have imagined that in two years I would have experienced all that I did. Um, but you'll be surprised once you get out there, uh, the various challenges that you will be faced with, uh, even at entry-level positions. Um, I was put in charge of producing a trade show that was in transition. It had been around for about 15 years, and for 10 of those years, it was very successful. And for the last five, it had uh, gone through some pretty tough times. Um, what I realized after uh, taking control of this for just a few days was that the salespeople in charge of this show were incredibly focused on uh, making revenue numbers and lost track of what the end customer uh, was calling for. Um, they were willing to lease the space to unqualified vendors um, and therefore ended up kind of clouding what the trade show was supposed to be. And in the end, what they ended up doing was um, creating a pretty sloppy presentation um, they deterred the uh, retail buyer from coming, and they didn't even end up making their revenue numbers. Um, there were a few things going on uh, behind the scenes. First, there was deceit in the actual sale of the trade show space. So they were calling both qualified vendors and unqualified vendors and uh, giving them different stories and didn't really care whether they should be in the show or not, if they were willing to give them money, they were selling them the space. And then there was a deceit in reporting the numbers um, you know, to the company. So what they would do was um, you know, get a verbal commitment from a vendor, uh, wouldn't actually get a signed contract, would input the numbers as sales, uh, kind of as a ghost contract, and um, in give the accounting department a bit of a runaround uh, when they were asking where is the actual money to back this contract up. And uh, at the end of the show, they would uh, last minute cancel them out. Um, you know, why was this happening? It was something that I was asking as I was going through this because they were certainly making my life very difficult. Um, and it wasn't because they were bad people. Uh, it was because they succumbed to pressures, uh, many pressures that uh, any of us um, 
you know, can fall under. Uh, they were, there were peer pressures, uh, so uh, wanting to have better sales than uh, the other salespeople in the company. There were competitive uh, pressures, so wanting to have better revenue numbers than the trade shows that we were competing with. And then there were executive level pressures, so the pressure to make your sales numbers or you're going to get fired. Um, I understood what they were going through because I, I was actually confronted with the same kinds of pressures. And I had to make a decision. Uh, was I going to do exactly what they had done and lie, call up the vendors, lie to them just to get their sales? Uh, or was I going to go into my boss and tell them that if they truly wanted to turn this around, then we were going to take a hit in our revenue numbers. I personally was going to take a hit on my bonus. And um, maybe then, in a year, in six months for the next show, uh, sales would come faster uh, because people would recognize that we were actively making changes. Um, I did receive support from my bosses on this, which was you know, really great. Um, but that didn't mean that the pressures went away. Um, I would go into sales meetings, and while my colleagues were reporting thousands of dollars of sales, I had zero week after week. And it was really hard. And at one point, I even had uh, one of my bosses ask me, you know, can't you just let, let this person in? It'll give you a couple more thousand dollars. Um, and I did stay true to uh, how I felt things needed to be done. And I was willing to go through that because I knew that every day I could walk into work and honestly call a prospective customer and tell them what we were doing and the exciting changes that were, were coming. Uh, in the end, I did not make my sales numbers, <laughs> to no one's surprise. Um, but under my supervision, the show was cleaned up. And I do check in uh, every now and again, and this would be a year later. And the sales cycle moves a lot quicker. They, they are selling it um, they're at about 85% capacity for this year's show, which was something that uh, when I was there, we hadn't experienced. Um, you know, and in this particular situation, I was lucky because I did have uh, my bosses, both the executive senior vice president and my managing director, uh, were understanding of what I was trying to accomplish. Um, but I do know um, that this will not always be the case, and it may not be the case in the situation that you may find yourself in. And so we all have to make a decision. And my best advice is to go into you know, your next job and be armed with some best business practices. And maybe have a couple of benchmark questions. Um, a couple that I found myself um, kind of asking was, you know, is what I'm being asked at the expense of my integrity? And uh, secondly, the one that I actually fell back on a lot was, if I had my own business, would I be doing this? And if I wouldn't be doing this, then, then why am I even entertaining the thought? Um, it's a very slippery slope, and um, you know, the earlier that you can correct it and uh, really train yourself to make the best decisions, then the better you'll be in the long run when you're confronted with even bigger situations. So with that, I'll pass it on to Carl. Well, <clears throat> when Professor Murphy asked us to uh, prepare a few examples of, of ethical dilemmas that we'd face in our early careers, I immediately thought of one that I had faced when I was working for a service organization in South America a few years back. And with this organization, uh, I had a great opportunity to work with many people in Brazil. Uh, and, and during my time that I was uh, in Brazil, I was responsible for this organization's finances for a period of about six months. And with these responsibilities uh, came the implementation of financial controls, of various accounting uh, reimbursements of various expenses for the uh, people involved in the administration of the organization. It was, it was just a great opportunity. Um, and so one thing that surprised me while I was in that role was the fact that despite all the financial controls that were in place in that organization, just like many organizations throughout the world, uh, people would still try to get away with some of the different uh, shenanigans and, and fraud uh, despite those controls being in place and how easy those controls made it to catch people who were participating in those activities. Uh, specifically, I had one uh, colleague who I became quite close friends with through my uh, few years working uh, with this organization. We'd work intimately uh, on a few projects together. And he was asked to serve in a position of leadership in the organization. 
and as such had access to uh, different things such as uh, increased, reimbur in increased expense account uh, per diems, uh, travel authorization, et cetera. And he actually started using these benefits to his own personal advantage and use, taking personal tours of the, the city and the countryside, uh, going to expensive restaurants on the organization's dime, et cetera. And uh, being in charge of the finances, these uh, unauthorized expenses came up pretty quick. And it was difficult for me at the time because this uh, gentleman had become a very close friend of mine through the work that we had done. But at the same time, I had my responsibilities to follow through with, and I couldn't just let this slide and uh, slip on quietly by. So I actually confronted my friend about it and uh, told him, hey, I, I know what's happening. I know what you're involved with, and you can't keep doing this. And he was uh, unfortunately very arrogant about his activities, felt like he was doing nothing wrong, and basically told me that it didn't matter what I thought, that he was just going to keep doing it. And so I told him basically that he, uh, he would have to tell our organization's uh, regional leader about what was happening or else I would, I would have to confront him myself with the information. And it, it was a hard position to be in because I felt like I was, asked, I was asked to choose between my friendship with this person and standing up for what was right. And it wasn't an easy decision to make, but ultimately the, I had values that I'd uh, tried to aspire to to that point in my life that I still do today, and no matter how strong the friendship or how good the relationship was, I knew that it would be very hard to live with myself if I didn't uh, uphold to those values and beliefs that I had. So unfortunately, I had to uh, sour that friendship with my, uh, my colleague, and it was, it was a very uncomfortable situation. It was a difficult one, uh, but ultimately, I feel like I did the right thing with that, and that's a situation I think that, that any of us could be involved in, in the future. Um, and more recently with my, my career as a, as a banker, uh, like Professor Murphy mentioned, I worked with a bank called Prime Alliance Bank. And while there was nothing as quite as blatant or severe as that other example in terms of ethical boundaries being crossed, uh, I was faced almost on a daily basis with constant pressure from two sides. One coming from the bank's management and their continual desire uh, to grow the business, to make more loans, to boost their profitability, to make their numbers look fantastic, not only for shareholders, uh, but for their uh, immediate managers, the board of directors. Uh, on the flip side of that, there was constant pressure from our clients who we were making loans to, to make their loan terms more favorable, make it easier for them to have access to credit. And in many ways, they would, uh, they would try to motivate us to be a little more lenient on their loan decisions through uh, I guess kickbacks such as uh, increased deposit relationships, uh, try to bring in some of their professional contacts to increase their deposits with our bank. Uh, and so, so it, was very, it was very complex in terms of balancing, you know, where do I draw the ethical line versus where do I, you know, draw the line in terms of how far I'm willing to go to further establish my own personal career. And, you know, in the financial services industry, there's a lot of pressure uh, to continue to do those on a daily basis. Uh, regulations don't completely eliminate that, I don't think. And so as professionals going out into those kinds of careers, I think the best thing that we can do is have a core set of values and beliefs that we aspire to, that we have already decided that we're gonna hold up to, so that when we are faced with those tough situations and those tough choices, the choice really isn't that tough. Uh, that's what I think is so wonderful about coming to a university like Notre Dame where there is a strict sense of value uh, in terms of, of personal beliefs and values. Um, it's, it's on the wall in the classrooms uh, and it's emphasized through many activities including uh, this lecture here tonight. So I guess my advice would be to simply decide where it is that you're going to draw that line and don't be afraid to make the choice to uphold that. Hi, um, my name is Matt Kelly, and uh, contrary to popular belief, I am not the long-lost cousin of Coach Kelly. <laughs> I am, however, a first-year MBA student and uh, a former uh, Irish bar and restaurant owner, uh, appropriately named uh, Kelly's. So as a former bar owner, as you can imagine, I've encountered quite a few ethical uh, challenges in my career. 
Um, but I had to dig a little deeper to find one uh, more appropriate, especially for the undergrads here, um, that would be applicable to, to you and, and your future careers. Um, uh, what I found uh, was that truth, uh, truth is a universal um, thing, and um, I, th I think you will find it um, amazingly challenging to be completely truthful at certain times in your, your upcoming careers. Um, so my perspective is a little different. Um, I was an owner, a manager of people, right, which is, is, is where most of, you, uh, most of you will be someday leading people. And um, as a result, you have uh, quite a, a responsibility to make decisions. And um, uh, oftentimes when you have uh, competing, your competing alternatives have uh, represent different values of yours. Um, in, in, um, in, in, in my uh, case, the, that kind of stakeholder conflict uh, reared its head uh, most apparently when I was making uh, my way through the MBA application process. <clears throat> so at the time I was uh, applying to Notre Dame, um, I was also applying for a new lease for the restaurant and bar. Uh, which was public knowledge and uh, was, was kind of a signal uh, for a long-term commitment um, at my home. Uh, staff and, and some patrons knew I was applying to business school locally, but they had no idea I was applying to Notre Dame, and I wasn't about to let them know because that would let them know that uh, the place would close. Um, it wasn't easy to keep that information from them. Um, I even had family in the area that I wouldn't discuss it with because a new word would get out. Um, and you might ask, you know, why, why would that be such a problem to let that information out? But um, if you've got a restaurant that's potentially closing, you've got quite a number of issues. You have uh, employees. Um, uh, they're going to look for other jobs. Um, uh, the ones that stay may, may steal from you or uh, do some unethical stuff. Um, you have uh, customers that will, they may take their business elsewhere. Uh, vendors will um, close their credit and, um, and not offer the same discounts. Um, and yet you still have your financial responsibilities to all of them, uh, to pay them, uh, to, to handle your credit, and to, and to pay yourself and provide for your family. So, um, you know, how do you keep all that straight? Um, um, you know, ethically, how do you withhold information from employees that have been with you over 10 years and have family of, families of their own? and uh, you consider friends? I mean, how do you go to work each day uh, acting like everything is, is normal when you know the second you get the call from admissions, you're out of there? Um, uh, I'm not sure I did the right thing, but this is, this is, this is how I uh, approached it. Um, the first thing, I, I, I knew that I was ethical. I knew that I was going to try to do everything within my power to, to help everyone involved. Um, and and I, I had a history of that, and I, I knew that I always tried to do that. So when you're constantly trying to do the right thing, it becomes a lot, a lot easier not to get uh, bogged down in the guilt that, that could easily surface um, in this kind of situation. Uh, second thing is I didn't know the future. There was no certainty that I was coming to Notre Dame. I mean, I was praying for it, and... Uh, uh, you know, I was hoping for it, but there was there was no guarantees. And until I heard from from Brian Lord, there was no there was nothing to go on. Um, so you really can't go through your career preoccupied with what ifs and and maybes. Uh, you'll find yourself in in quite a few other dilemmas if you do so. Um, next, I find there's a difference between telling the truth and telling people everything that you believe. Um, you know, for me, I didn't respond to anyone who, who was uh, feeling entitled to know what I was thinking, um, even when they questioned me directly on it. And you might ask, well, you know, sometimes people will put you in that awkward position, you know, where if you don't answer one way or the other, they kind of know what is going on. Um, and in that scenario, um, you know, I find you have to prioritize your values. Um, you know, for me, it was telling the truth uh, you know, is it greater than uh, hurting someone's reputation or hurting someone physically? No, it's not. Is it greater than, um, 
you know, my responsibility to my, to my young family. At that point, it wasn't. And, um, you know, I'm maybe a little embarrassed to say there were a few light, white lies that, that occurred at that point, but I felt like my values were still intact because of the priority I had placed on them. Finally, um, I always proactively managed my reputation. I didn't get myself involved in a lot of the gossip, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the you know, information sharing that goes on in the office, um, or in my case, in the bar. I tried to keep myself away from that and, and kind of neutral throughout uh, the 10 years that I owned the restaurant. And um, as a result, I wasn't put in that awkward spot as often as, as I could have been. Um, as it turned out, um, when I did uh, accept to Notre Dame, uh, things worked out uh, for the best on, on all, all fronts. Uh, I had, uh, there were some, some things uh, in motion externally that presented themselves and allowed me to give employees um, opportunities that weren't there initially. Um, and it also allowed me to uh, pay off all my debts and, and pay off um, you know, all the financial responsibilities and, and continue to stay liquid. So. Thank you. We have time for a few questions here. Uh, I'm sure that somebody would like to follow up with our panelists. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for coming out and sharing some of your stories with us today. Um, Matt, your story reminded me a bit of my decision when I decided to come back to get my MBA and uh, some of the difficulties I had with telling my boss if I was going to go back or if I was looking to go back to school to leave our company. Could you talk to me a bit today about mentors you guys have had in your life and people that have helped you decide how to stay on the right path and how to deal with certain issues that you faced at work? Sure. Um, for me, I mean, my mentor in that regard was always my mother. So she was, um, you know, very faithful and, and uh, she was very honest and, and she always tried to do the right thing. And so that was, kind of, it kind of came natural to me to try to do the right thing. Uh, actually, you know, going through with that took a lot of practice and 10 years of running a business, um, you know, uh, as a young person, it, it gave me a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of time to, uh, to trial and error and, and, and learn. And I, I guess the best, um, the best thing I could say is, you know, make sure you learn from the mistakes that you make because uh, those are the most valuable things that, that come into your experience. You guys have anything? Well, kind of to echo Matt's comments, uh, my greatest mentor in life has probably been my father. Um, just, he's always been that go-to guy when I needed advice in a tough situation, somebody that I could trust, uh, whose opinion I could uh, take at face value and not have to worry if there was any kind of double meaning to it. Uh, and my dad has always been that guy who was, uh, he's always shot straight with me and, and his advice has 99.9% .9 of the time been right. Uh, so. I, I think many of us can probably have similar sentiments towards how we feel about our parents, but uh, my dad's been that good mentor for me in my personal and uh, professional life. Um, when it actually came time to um, figuring out how, I, how and when I was going to tell my employer that I was coming back to school, um, I actually found uh, my boss was my greatest mentor. I was very lucky. And I did confide in her throughout the entire process. First, I needed her recommendation. And second, um, I knew that you know, she had, had been very good to me, so it was important for me to be honest with her. Um, I ran all my questions uh, through her, and um, you know, it helped kind of put me at ease. Uh, and she actually did um, help me determine that, you know, give, give the company more than two weeks' notice. I, I did give them about a five-week buffer to give them time to bring somebody else in and 
um, you know, instead of just kind of dashing right away. So I think, it, it, you know, and my father was as well, you know, a great person to talk with. He did manage a, a brokerage firm, uh, which was good to bounce ideas off of. But if you have somebody in your company that you can, uh, that is your mentor that you can confide in, I think that that's good as well, um, because those are the people that you're dealing with day in and day out. I'm sure there's a person who has a private question, so we will leave it that Armin and our panelists will be happy to stay around for a few minutes if you have a specific question you'd like to ask any of them, but please join with me in thanking our Father Ted, Armin, Ali, and our panelists for a great program. Thank you. Thank you.